Our next session is going to be by Dr. Patricia Brisso, who will be doing a presentation on the topic of breaking the stigma, mental health conversations in black and ethnic communities. Dr. Patricia Brito is qualified educational psychologist uh, and a mother with practical uh, uh, and research experience. Her qualifications include a doctorate in professional educational, child and adolescent psychology from UCL Institute of Education, masters in mental health and learning disabilities, and a bachelor's in psychology. Please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Patricia Brito. psychologist here at a career conference? Well, that's because your mental health matters. If you are not looking after your mental health, your career may be quite challenging to implement and for you to pivot and make progress as you would like. Now, I'm an educational child and adolescent psychologist. And again, you might think, why is someone with that title here? Well, that's because I'm on a mission to make a systemic change in how we support children and young people. And to do that, I need to educate people who are not children and young people to learn how to support them, whether it's to do with your mental health or your neurodiverse needs. And even if you don't have children, if you're an uncle, an aunt, or you have a neighbor, you need to learn some of these strategies and some of these skills so that you can be a great support system. So there's so many layers to make a systemic change and this is one of it. So thank you for having me here today. Okay. So uh, that's just an introduction. So we'll be talking about mental health, um, especially in the diverse space that we are in. I think it's a it's, it's made a lot of progress, but there's still a long way to go. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with my qualifications. We've already spoken about that. Um, the perception of mental health in the black and ethnic communities, like I said, is, is making progress. Um, but you still have people who still see mental health as something that we shouldn't really address and not really consider it as an uh, integral part of our overall holistic health because your mental health is just as important as your physical health. And the stigma makes people reluctant to seek support, to seek services. I mean, I had a friend say to me the other day, why do you need a therapist? Just speak to your mum. Yes, you can speak to your mum, but your mum isn't a qualified professional that has the skills to be able to help you to process your feelings and regulate your emotions. Regulate, that's a key word. Because if you, if you can't regulate yourself, you can't regulate anyone, whether it's children and young people or those around you. So cultural beliefs is a big part. I am British Nigerian, so I think I'm okay to say that uh, within you know, my culture, mental health, neurodiversity, it's not something that people welcome to talk about at a dinner table, for example. Uh, it's making a lot of progress, but it, it's not there yet. And um, you have uh, you know, services, but the services are very limited, and people still see it as a taboo, a discussion that you shouldn't really talk about. Or you can just pray your way through. I think I, I've got permission to say that as well, because I'm a Christian. Yes, you can pray your way through, but also there are people who I believe, you know, as a Christian, God has given the intellects to have this knowledge on how to help you. So faith and spirituality is a significant factor of this stigma. And then there's a history of systemic racism as well and um, socioeconomic difficulties. I mean, we've been going through austerity for a number of years now and things are worsening and not getting better in England. Um, possibly part of the other parts of the world as well. And that has a huge impact on stress. It has a huge impact on parenting. Did you know that parental stress is now a public health issue? That there's about 33%, so one in three of parents have chronic stress. And I'm a parent, so I can believe that. And that's you know research that I, I came across quite recently. And that's worrying because, again, we make up society. 
regardless of what race you are. And when we're raising children or we're supporting children or we're looking after anyone's children, they are the future for the next generation. So if we are not well, how can we help anyone else be well? And for anyone who's been on a plane before, they always ask you, make sure you put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you can on others. So that's why I'm here. So I thought I will share that quick you know, introduction before you think, why is she here to talk about this? This is meant to be about careers. So we have to educate. We have to raise awareness. And the information you gather from me today, please pass it on because we have to keep sharing this information. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about how it links to your workplace. And if you are an employer or you are an employee, you will benefit from this as well. So why should your workplace care about your mental health? Well, it reduces stress and it's going to improve your productivity and your performance, improve your personal and professional relationships and increase overall job life satisfaction. So it should be the top of their priority. You know, um, in psychology we say safeguarding is everyone's business, whether you are a psychologist or social worker or a cleaner in an organization. If you notice something that is worth raising, you have to raise it so everyone gets safeguarding training. Um, why isn't that happening in other workplaces, even if it's not a health service or an education service? I believe that's, that should be integral to um, everyone's training in terms of when you first start a job, you should learn safeguarding. And safeguarding is not just about safeguarding children, but safeguarding yourself. You are important. And I love an iceberg. So often when things are going wrong in a workplace or things are going wrong in your personal life or someone else's personal life, whether it's a child or an adult, you might see the top part of the iceberg, controlling, aggressive, and this could be your boss. If your boss is here, don't look at him or her. Um, oppositional, distant, rude, angry, withdrawn, overly happy. Yes, there's such a thing called toxic positivity. When you know something is negative, but you have to be positive about it. That's quite common in my culture, by the way where you have to just say, it is well. <laughs> when it's not well, why can't we just call it as it is and deal with the problem? Daydreaming, manipulative, that's what you see at the surface, but there's so much more going on underneath. Often, people who are controlling are actually very fearful they're very anxious people. Some of them are suffering from severe anxiety. So if you see the top behavior and you're an employer, you should really dig deep into thinking about what is going on underneath the iceberg. So some people are going through panic attacks. They're numb, confused. They feel unsafe. And that could be because of you know, racial disparity, discrimination, or other personal matters. Um, worthless, scared, unloved, worried, and frightened. So there's always so much more. So the question we often ask in psychology, and I often ask in my service, is what is the function of the behavior? So when someone is displaying a particular behavior, it's really important to ask why? What is the function? What is that serving? And uh, I mean, we've spoken a lot about neurodiversity. So for example, if someone is, you know, um, very hypervigilant and always scanning the room and always jumpy, what is the function of that? What is that serving? Is that some kind of coping mechanism? And how do we address that? It's not just, you know, this is an issue, you, you know, you can't meet deadlines and all of this, and you, you know, you can't time management, you have organizational difficulties, and we just end the conversation there. No, we should be thinking about how do we address this to help the person cope? Because when you go to work, you're not just an individual, you're an individual with families, with loved ones, with baggage, and you are expected to park that and just work. That's not reality. Even if you are suppressing it, it will come out at the time when you don't expect it to. 
So it's really important that we don't just talk about what we see, but what we don't see, and address the unseen bits so that what you see would be a lot more positive, rather than just saying, it is well. Identify priorities. People take, how many people take sick days here? Is that for your physical health or for your mental health? Good. I'm glad. Because you can take sick days for your mental health. You can have a mental health day. Did you know that? So it's important that workplaces prioritise this. Allow people to have their mental health days. And that's not a day to go to the hairdressers to get your hair done. <laughs> but that's a day to regulate your feelings, return back to a calm state so that you can function adequately and meet all your demands at work and in your personal life. It improves productivity. So, you know, again, if you're having to um, convince your workplace, these are all suggestions that you could use in your argument. And recognizing that mental health is vital, just as much as physical health is really important. Um, if you had a headache, you would take a paracetamol. So if you're feeling low, if you're feeling depressed, if you are struggling to manage time, if you are struggling to focus, that's time for you to start doing some reflection and thinking, what is going on here? And there's so many factors. I found when I became a mother, all of a sudden my attention and concentration skills reduced when I went back from maternity leave uh, before I started my own practice. I run my practice at Harley Street. Before that, I went back to work and I, I just really struggled to focus because I was thinking about multiple things. I mean, they say, you know, there's such thing as baby brain. I think that's real because I really struggled. I was thinking about my child, thinking about so many, you know, things, and it was such a struggle to concentrate to the point where you probably would think I had ADHD. But that wasn't the case. It was just the case where I was going through transition. It's really important that your workplace understand that you are human beings. How can you're not robots? You know, there's a lot of talk about AI and uh, you know and all these things. If your workplace want a robot, then they should hire one. But you're a human beings, so they have to be very flexible in how they are working and connecting with you. And don't be scared to raise that. They're hoping you don't know that information, but now you know. Um, you know, there's so many different sort of matrix that workplaces can do to find out what's going on. You know, there's something called a SWOT analysis. I use that in my practice in terms of what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And if the threat is your mental well-being and uh, you know, difficulty to regulate your feelings, that needs to be addressed. Regular check-ins. Now, as part of my practice, every psychologist has a psychologist as a rule. Yes, so I have a psychologist who I see once a month and we call it supervision. And it doesn't mean that it's time to just talk about work, but it's also my personal life and my well-being. That is needed because I'm dealing with complex cases from you know, children that uh, have gone through abuse, physical and emotional abuse, and children that are you know, um, at risk of um, exploitation, counter lines and things like that. Uh, so I need that supervision. But why isn't that common practice in every workplace? Why doesn't every person have access to, whether it's a well-being coach or psychologist? You know, that, that should just be a given. And if you are not um, at an advantage stage of having that, then seek that support from your workplace. And if that's not available, then I would definitely recommend that you seek that support for yourself because it's really important that you have those regular check-ins. Loved ones and families are great, but after a while they'll get tired of you, coming to them with your concerns, but your prof your, a professional wouldn't, that's, that's their job. And they have the tools, they have the expertise. So that's really important. Um, encourage breaks and downtime. How many people take a lunch break? That's a very small percentage in this room, <laughs> you know? And you don't get paid for that hour, by the way. So wh why don't you take it? Actually, can someone tell me why? Why don't you take a lunch break? You didn't put your hand up. <laughs> Sorry, it's too long. The to-do list is too long. 
But do you realise it's counterproductive to keep working without taking a break? You would just be thinking about what you have to do rather than actually doing it. So you need to take that lunch break. It's, it's very important. I, I make a big deal about it. And, uh, you know, other downtime, you know, also there should be a celebration of cultures and have culture breaks where you talk about your different cultures. You know, we are human beings. Again, we are not robots. We have to remember that. And um, we should have guilt-free mental health days. We should have guilt-free well-being days. Again, because when I used to work for a local, local authority, uh, we used to have well-being days where we would, we would uh, go and have a picnic, for example, or um, they would plan some kind of event. But that should be a given. And you could be the first person to champion that if that's not happening already. And, um, you know, there's lots of project management tools, delegating tasks is very important, reflection, reflection, reflect, reflect, reflect. Every Friday in my household, we think about three things. What's gone well, what hasn't gone well, and what could we do better? You could do that for yourself, you could do that with your partner, with your household, it's really important. My household is like an institution to me because um, you know, if that's not intact, I can't focus, I can't run a practice, I can't be a mother, I can't be a wife. So it's really important that I um, find a way, there's no such thing as work-life balance, that doesn't exist, but it's about creating that shift of which one is more priority now and which one isn't and trying to you know, make sure everything flows in the best possible way and sometimes it all falls flat <laughs> and that's okay. I give myself the um, permission to repair as well um, and I always say, especially with my child, if I lose it, I apologize. I repair. That's really important and I recognize that um, I'm not perfect so why should anyone be perfect? So to have that the outcome of all of this is a balanced, productive work environment with clear priorities and valued mental health. Social support is very key. Having support from family, yes. Again, don't make it a case where they, you become a burden to them. But yes, seek that support from family and friends, co-workers. Don't be afraid to seek assistance or confide in those who are nearest to you. Social support can alleviate stress and offer a clearer perspective. Most workplaces have well-being support. Uh, even when you know, we went through bereavement in my family, I was offered bereavement support. I didn't even know that existed until it was raised to me. So it's important that you ask these questions in whichever organization that you work for. So um, can I have one or two questions? No, OK. okay. Um, well, thank you so much for listening. I hope you found that very useful. If you want to find out more about who I am and my services, my Instagram and that's my website uh, www.mogueps.com and uh, I wish you all the best. Um, thank you so much Dr Patricia Brito. We're going to give you two minutes to kind of stretch your legs and in fact in that